And this goes back to the coalitions of the parties, right? So the Democratic Party caters largely to these like white affluent women basically is like the the base that they Joga. mostly right i know the space well i'm <laughs> closely see, affiliated with the space i right? want to see joe biden do the joga the joga I mean, base i'll pay right? for that and so you know for those for people who are more or less doing well as things are right they've got their health insurance they've got a job where they're treated like a human being with humanity they can get their uber eats they can get whatever they want on demand Right, their way of, of virtue signaling is on identity issues. And if you only confine the conversation on policing to like, let's deal with this, let's let's have more body cameras, like if you keep it in that lane, that's very comfortable for them. Right. If you have a broader conversation about a society that, you know, has decimated unions, has decimated working class power, about who has power in the society and why, like that's more of a threat to them. So yes, for corporate brands, it's very comfortable to have like, let's have a diversity initiative. It's less comfortable to say, no, no, let's actually value the worth of everyone. Let's actually have a different set of power. Let's actually Mm -hmm. not have corporations able to give unlimited money and buy off our politicians and then be able to go work on your boards, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's a very non-threatening conversation. That's how you end up with, was it Bank of America who sponsored the the movement continues? Yes, like the Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, the movement continues with Ray McKesson, who's a prominent activist. Yeah. To Go be ahead. cynical, is yeah. there uh, another reason why Amazon would support this protest that this is kind of the death of retail? I mean, yeah. this is one yeah. of the final nails in the coffin of True. retail. When so, you think about absolutely. investing your money in a brick and mortar store with a, a glass window after all this horseshit. Look, I, I, I won't cite who told me this was a very prominent person in the field of economics and was like, my conspiracy theory is that Jeff Bezos wants 10 to 15 percent unemployment because then what's the best job in the world joe in a rural place amazon warehouse he's the guy dropping off those bricks (laughs) <laughs> who, who's better at delivering shit than Amazon? Right. There you go. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> Amazon Prime delivering pallets of you bricks. Should, you should but, be more cynical because that, I mean, look, how else do we get to a point where like the Shell Gas Company sponsors a 1619 Project event with Nicole Hannah-Jones? Ar- I don't around, know what that is. So the 1619 Project, oh man, this is a real rabbit hole. So this is Uh-oh. like, this is the New York Times put out this thing. The 1619 Project is the year that the first slaves were brought to America. And it was about reforming the way that we talk about race and slavery in America. And so the, the very first essay which she wrote, which is very controversial, is when she claimed that the reason for the American Revolution was because people wanted to keep their slaves, not because of you know control from England and all that. What happened is, is that a bunch of very prominent historians around the American Revolution, the Civil War, and much more panned the essay. They said, this thing needs to be corrected. They corrected it. Even then, she still won the Pulitzer Prize for journalism, or for commentary, I want to say, for that specific essay, which was which, which was there. And they partnered, I think it was with the Pulitzer Center, in order to create curriculum that schools are now using to teach. Now, this was attacked, the 1619 Project, not at first by conservatives. Of course, conservatives were pissed off. It was attacked by the inter- by World Socialist website, by Trotskyites, by Marxists and socialists. And the reason why is because they saw it for what I see it, which is that it's a cynical attempt in order to say America is an irredeemably racist nation, that that is the only single and most pressing problem that we have in our society. And if you hold that frame, then you don't ask questions about corporate power in America. You don't ask questions even of leaders. A friend of our show, Zed Jelani, had a fantastic appearance on our show. I really encourage everybody to go watch it, where he talks about if you look at the black community in America, which is what had the most pressing impact on their life economically and destroyed so much of their livelihood. It was the foreclosures under Barack Obama and it was the wipeout of black home ownership and black wealth. That the, that the 1619 Project and the framework of politics that that original sin, which of course is the original sin, is the be all end all for why we are where we are today, absolves current political leaders and recent political leaders like Barack Obama himself or like leaders in the city of Atlanta or leaders in the city of Baltimore and that it absolves public policy which is non-racial. And so when I say that why does Shell Gas Company feel comfortable 
sponsoring an event in which the main message is that is that America is an irredeemably racist nation because they that is one more event which is being talked about in the political zeitgeist by the cultural elite which is not talking about their own power in the marketplace and if you look at who what is the the predominant control in your life in America it is about capital it's not about race it's about class class but class disproportionately affects people of color in America and so the way I look at it is that identity politics is so cynically grafted on by the billionaire and the corporate class. There's a reason they're all super woke. It's because they want it to be this way so that we don't talk about their power in our society. And I think this was a very cynical, like the way this all happened is kind of a crazy because it started out in the sociology departments in the 1970s of all of these crazy, you know, these from the post, uh, from the 60s era. They were, you know, they, in these sociology departments, and they started cranking out all these absolutely crazy papers around, you know, feminism and pl identity politics, racial politics, all of that. And then what happened is, is that corporate America and other cultural elites, first of all, were being indoctrinated in the university system. They were going to go work at places like McKinsey and others, and they brought their racial politics and their identity politics with them. But that there had to be a recognition from the top from people like Goldman Sachs. If Goldman Sachs, if the pressure on them is to stop the way that they trade derivatives or to put a black person on their board while they continue to you know, do the derivatives trading, they're gonna choose that every single time. Right. So they wanna direct the conversation in that direction. It absolves them for the sins, both you know, towards the economically disenfranchised in America, but it's also a very cynical tool, which is that why is it that you see all these corporations, go, you know, tweeting out Black Lives Matter, Instagram blackout, all that stuff. How is it that you see, like, Ni you know, Nike? Isn't this the great irony that Nike, you know, went and did the whole Colin Kaepernick thing, the ad campaign, and they still got all their shit looted in this in this most recent <laughs> thing in Chicago, right? I mean, I, I think that is that's the perfect example of they mm. try to cynically use identity politics in America, split people apart to protect their power, and if we start to understand that it's a lot more about class in America than it is about race. I'm not saying that there is not racial problems in America, racism, that, you know, all of this, but that if you focus on these class issues, it's the best way to help people, uh, you know, to people who are disenfranchised, who are disproportionately people of color, but to help everybody. That's a much more, I just don't know how else we can live in a multifaceted, multifaceted nation like this, which is, you know, economically heterogeneous, e ethnically, People, you know, so many people of different ethnicities, so many people of different religions, so many. I mean, I am the son of Indian immigrants. I feel fully and completely American. That's an amazing thing. That didn't just happen. It was the product of a result of very specific political choices that we made over time. And it's moving towards that that we need to go towards. And that's what, but by doing so, what you've talked about many times about economic not just distribution but about the power who has power in society working class or not yeah which is the corporate america can use the identity politics in order to make sure the working class doesn't continue to have power and so you can't separate class and race because it's not an accident of course that um black and brown people are disproportionately the lower income and and poor and working class in society i mean i i see it much more simply sort of like what you were saying it's it's virtuous it's just like brand a branding exercise yeah, I think right so. yeah. and there's this whole idea i I always think it's hilarious on the right of like Facebook and Twitter are progressive or they're liberal companies or Amazon's a liberal company. I'm like, what are you talking about? Amazon treats their workers like shit. They bust you. And it's like, this is not a left company, right? But because they use those sort of branding tools mm -hmm. and tweet out Black Lives Matter, which is no threat to them. And in fact, as you're pointing out, may very much benefit their bottom line. Ultimately, yeah. they're sort of they get all the benefits of being for progress and being for this rising coalition in America without actually having to do anything that's going to benefit their bottom line. Yeah.